My name is Dan Goldberger. I'm a partner here at Dorsey & Whitney and a member of our U.S.-China practice group. On behalf of Dorsey & Whitney, we're proud to host the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and we welcome you to this program, China in the World, Africa, which is part of the committee's 50th anniversary series. Tonight, we are privileged to host Dr. Deborah Brodigam, a distinguished scholar and National Committee director who will discuss her new book, Will Africa Feed China? China is very important to us at Dorsey. Our China practice includes both litigation and transactional matters and spans across our numerous offices in the U.S., along with our offices in China and Hong Kong. I'm sure that you share with us an interest in this timely aspect of China's geopolitical activity. Over the last few years, Africa has been the focus for China's efforts to extend its global influence throughout the developing world as an alternative to U.S.-led international order. It is used an interesting combination of soft power and hard cash, which we'll learn a lot more about tonight. We thank everyone for coming, and we hope you enjoy the program. These are yours. Well, let me just thank Dan and, and our friends at, at Dorsey & Whitney. We, of course, are introduced to Dor Dorsey & Whitney by Nelson Dong, who is in the Seattle office and is a director in great standing at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Today we're here to discuss what is truly a terrific book. It's outside, um, and the author will be here to autograph it afterward for you, but it importantly, it debunks mythologies about China. And that is so important that we have research that actually gets to what is actually going on. We see all of these headlines, but nobody digs down. And this book digs down on what China really has been doing in Africa. And having read it over the last several days, it is a page turner and an eye opener. So Deborah, it's wonderful to have you here. I should say that her previous talk is just about the most highly downloaded talk that the National Committee has ever had, which is in now in excess of 45,000 uh, downloads. And it's perfect that we're starting this China and the World series, which Dorsey is going to host in its entirety. It's great that we're starting it with a talk which is going to not deal with the view from 60,000 feet, but really get into the trenches and see where the mythologies are and how they, in some cases, are not true. Deborah's a director, as Dan said, a director of the committee and an esteemed academic from uh, Hopkins School of International Studies. So I welcome you, and thank you so much for coming up here to educate us. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you, Steve. Um, it is always super fun to launch a book, and so I am really delighted to be back at the council for this one. Now, let me make sure I know how to. Thank you. <laughs> how to move this forward and backward? Hmm. There. All right. So. What does China want? In this picture, apparently, China wants a Big Mac. But the question about what China wants with regard to its food security is a serious question. And China's rise being the most important geopolitical issue of this millennium, as we're starting out, understanding what China wants and how China's going about meeting its wants and getting that right is important to all of us. In Africa, China's rise is usually portrayed as threatening. We see it's the new colonialist uh, reaching out, uh, voraciously grabbing things in Africa. And I think there's no area in this China-Africa relationship that's more misunderstood than the question about what China wants with regard to African land. Now, China has 9% of the world's arable land, maybe even less, and 20% of the world's population. And about 20 years ago, the ecologist Lester Brown wrote 
a little book with the title, Who Will Feed China? And some of you may be familiar with this book. And in this book, he predicted that as the Chinese middle class expanded, and as their demand for grain grew, that demand would wreak havoc on global grain markets. And this is something that caused a lot of concern in China when it was first published. So in about 2008, it seemed as though Lester Brown's predictions were coming true. Uh, global grain prices were high, and people believed that the Chinese were acquiring land in Africa. And so we saw a lot of things being said in the media about this. Africa, it was said, was going to become China's farm. Uh, the chief economist of the African Development Bank said China is already the biggest land grabber in Africa and in the world, he added to that. So let me give you a few other examples uh, from other media reports. Um, a Chinese uh, China now has extensive holdings in Africa, including pending or attempted deals for millions of hectares in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Uganda, and Tanzania, with many thousands of Chinese workers brought in to work on these lands. On an Israeli news website, we read, Chinese farms control most of Zambia's agriculture. And CBS News, which I understand is right here, they published on their website an article saying China recently purchased half the farmland under cultivation in the Congo. So the first idea, what I look at in the book, is this idea that the Chinese have actually acquired a lot of land in Africa. The second idea is that this is being directed by Beijing, the kind of China Inc. So for example, the Daily Mail, which you know is the most profound newspaper in Britain, they said, the strategy has been carefully devised by officials in Beijing. And at a major Washington, D.C. think tank, we read, China has invested immense sums in African agriculture. So this belief is out there that the Chinese government is leading this. And the third area of belief in the conventional wisdom is that the purpose of acquiring all this land is to grow food to send back to China. And so the Rockefeller Foundation, just down the street, wrote that the growing Chinese desire for African-produced food could mean that the poor people in African countries may no longer have the resources they need to survive. So this is a kind of profound belief here. And then finally, we read that the uh, Chinese are sending farmers from China to grow all this food to send back, to back home. And uh, in this case, even crime novelists have gotten in on this. So Henning Menkel, whom some of you may know as, as uh, Kurt Volander, the, the author of the Kurt Volander detective series, he told a French magazine that, I read just the other day that China has rented land in Kenya to move one million peasants to Africa. So I'll give you one more quote, and this is from the Voice of America, who interviewed an American business school professor. And he said, there are a lot of Chinese farmers in Zimbabwe tilling the Zimbabwean soil, growing crops that are sent back to China while the people of Zimbabwe starve. So I think that gives you a, a little bit of the flavor of the conventional wisdom that's out there about what the Chinese are doing. And what I do in my book is examine all of this, all of, the, all of these cases. And I can tell you that everything I've just told you right now, there isn't evidence to support any of those beliefs. So let me go into this a little bit. So first of all, I'll tell you that I had a little bit of a head start in doing this research. And some of you know that I've been working on uh, China and Africa as a researcher since 1983. So don't, don't ask me <laughs> where I was in my career at that point. But in case you weren't sure which one was there, that's, that's me in the middle. And so in 1983, um, I was doing research on what the Chinese were doing in rural Africa. And so I had a head start, and uh, a lot of what I was reading in media reports seemed to me to be not consistent with what I'd been uh, doing research on or writing about. So here's another piece of evidence about my, uh, my background on this issue. And so we did a number of things. I worked with a research team on this book. It took three years to do the research. And we, the first thing we did was we collected 60 cases of uh, purported Chinese 
large-scale land acquisition or agricultural investment in Africa. And we did this by looking at databases, for example, or things in the media. And this one, for example, is not mine. It's just one I pulled to illustrate this. This has uh, three or four examples up there. One of them says Zambia, 4.9 million acres requested for biofuels. Another says 7 million acres uh, requested to produce, acquired to produce biofuels in um, the uh, the. Democratic Republic of the Congo, the DRC. So these are the kinds of things. We put 60 cases together, um, and we examined each one of them. And we did this using a technique, uh, Steve, that you will uh, find interesting, I think. It's one that I call forensic internet sleuthing. So it's kind of detective work on the internet. Have any of you watched CSI Miami? this kind of television show. Well, you know, they, they usually have someone in the background there who's like on the internet and they can like track down criminals and so on with all these clever ways. Well, my team and I did this with each one of these 60 cases to try to track down what we could actually find on the internet. And some of these cases were very easy to debunk. And I'll give you one example in just a moment. Uh, this is a so the second thing we did was field work. We went to 12 countries in Africa where these big investments were supposed to be happening, and we talked to the uh, farmers, we talked to the companies. Um, and uh, so we went there to actually go into the rural areas to get the real story. And the third thing we did was to look at the whole Chinese government incentive infrastructure, all of the Chinese materials coming out of the Ministry of Agriculture, the policy banks, um, and so on, Ministry of Commerce, to see what is the Chinese government doing to try to encourage companies to go into Africa. And then fourth, we looked at the trade data. So I'm not going to go over all this list here, but I'm just going to go over it very, very quickly to show you the kinds of categories of what we found with this data. These are 20 out of the 60 cases. So the first group is things where we found no evidence that there was ever anything. It was a mistake of some kind. Or um, as in the case that I'm going to disappear right now, you see Nigeria, just that $2 billion Chinese rice investment. This is an example where we read uh, that there was going to be a $2 billion Chinese rice investment. So some quick internet sleuthing. We found another article. It turns out it's 2 billion naira, not dollars. Okay, so that's $17 million. Still <laughs> fairly significant, but not 2 billion. We find the name of the company. It's Ofada VT. Well, VT, I'm thinking, and I did this research, that doesn't sound like a Chinese company, V-E-E-T-E-E. -E -E -E. So I just Googled that, and it turns out it's a basmati rice producer in India. Another minute or two on the Internet, and we find out that this is three rice mills that the Indian company, VT, Basmati, is bringing in to the Yoruba area, which Ofada means rice, in Nigeria. And they're going to set them up in order to process rice. So China's $2 billion rice investment turns into an Indian, uh, basically, an export of rice uh, processing. So these kinds of things um, were pretty quick to get rid of. So we got rid of this one and this one where we could find no evidence that anything had ever existed. Then there were uh, another group which turned out to be investments that happened in 1990 or 1987. The Chinese have been investing for a long time in Africa. Fairly small scale farms that were acquired by different companies. So we were able to disappear a few of those there. Um, some of them were former Chinese aid projects. The Chinese were building state farms in Africa as long ago as the 1960s. And during the structural adjustment period when African governments were privatizing all these state-owned assets, Chinese companies came back and they purchased some of these or leased them. So we found a few of those there. So these are quite old investments. Then we found construction contracts where Chinese companies were building something for an African government that wanted to build a new state farm. So several disappeared that way. Then we found investments where there was some Chinese interest. But these were hugely exaggerated. So for example, this one, uh, 4,800 hectares, that one ended up not happening. We did investigate it. Uh, we found they were interested in making the investment. Um, and it's a complicated story that you, you can read in, in, uh, in the book. Uh, but it hinges on Hong Kong and Jamaica. So I'll just say it's, it has nothing to do, well, very little to do actually with Benin. So that one disappeared. Um, this one was 14,000 hectares in Cameroon. It turned out to be about 80 hectares in reality. So this one, which is um, 
in Ethiopia, a Chinese company was interested. They were actually given a lease on this land. They went down to see the land, and they said there aren't any roads here. And so they uh, decided not to invest. Um, this one was a similar thing. Again, they couldn't make a profit. And these two were real. And I might have time to tell you a little bit about at least one of those. Uh, but they're very interesting because these were private Chinese companies that did have an intention not to grow food, but to do biofuels. And as you can imagine, with the price of fuel these days, these are not uh, viable projects as well. Then we've got the one in Sierra Leone. We're still tracking. This one might happen. I think it's a very real possibility. It would be a rubber plantation. But they were scared away by the Ebola crisis. So that one. So there we've got three. So in terms of something that's happened over the past decade that could be qua uh, called some kind of land acquisition or a land grab, you've, you've come down to three. So if all those 60 cases had been added up, if they all had actually happened, it would be about 6 million hectares, which is about 1% of all the arable land in Africa. It's really quite a bit of land. But in reality, out of those 60 cases, we found that 239 and 365,000 hectares were acquired. And that includes one that never got into the media. This is a Chinese uh, company, Sinochem, that acquired a Singapore company. So in all of the data, it looks like a Chinese investment into Singapore. But GMG Global has plantations in Africa, primarily in Cameroon. And so that's about 130,000 hectares. So almost, more than half of that total figure is just this one acquisition. So. I met a lot of people along the way, and many of them were Africans who, interestingly enough, were trying very hard to get Chinese to invest in their country. This is Zaidi Ali, and as an example of my research skills, I actually tracked him down on LinkedIn. <laughs> very useful. So he agreed to meet me. Uh, we met in Maputo in Mozambique. So what I wanted to know from him is I knew there had been this Chinese investment by a and grain and oils group called China Grain and Oils Group in Mozambique in 2004. And I could not find out. I knew it had stopped. And I couldn't find out what happened to it. There were no stories. No journalists had ever gone there. It just was out there as a story. And so I tracked him down because he was the investor. He invested with China Grain and Oils Group. So I said to him, I took him for lunch at a very nice hotel in Maputo. I said, tell me what happened. I'm so interested. He said to me, well, in 2004, I was able to get access to a piece of land in Mozambique, and I decided to grow soybeans. But I didn't know how to grow soybeans, so I went to Brazil, because they know how to grow soybeans and they speak Portuguese. And while he was there, he met people from China Grain and Oils Group. They were there buying soybeans, because, of course, uh, Brazil is exporting a lot of soy to China. And uh, they exchanged cards, as, of course, one does. Then he went home. They went back to, to Beijing. He kept thinking about them. And then he decided to fly to Beijing and go and meet them and try to persuade them to come to Mozambique and invest in his land and do soybeans with him. So they did come. They sent a delegation. They decided to do the investment. And then the first year, they had a drought. In the second year, some kind of insects attacked the soybeans. And the project failed. Now, they, it failed in part because Mozambique has no institutional infrastructure to support soybeans. They don't have any research on it. There's no extension service. There's no, no one you can call the 911 soybean help. If an insect attacks, you can't send your samples anywhere for studying. So it failed. But he said to me when we were walking out of the hotel, I would welcome those Chinese to come back again. I learned so much from them even though he lost a lot of money on this investment. So that's an African bringing a Chinese company in. This is another example, and I probably don't have time to tell you this, but this is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is the investment, the largest purported investment, the one that CBS News said was half the arable land in the Congo. This was going to be a big biofuels project, and the investor was a private company, was very interested in doing uh, biofuels. But they, they were given an area of land, which would have been about 100,000 hectares, not 3 million, which is the area that got into the the media, 100,000 hectares in three different parts over here. So the investors brought a plane, they, they circled about the area, they took soil samples with some experts in oil palm, and they found that it was a really good area for growing oil palm. There was just a problem if you look at this area, the same kind of problem they faced in Ethiopia, no roads. So this investor brought in 
uh, a team of river experts from China. And uh, they decided to go up the river to study whether or not they could bring equipment and materials and build a factory and everything and go up and down the river. And on the first day, they hit a sandbar because the Congo is a natural river. It shifts. It's not being dredged. And so the sand shifts here, it shifts there, so that whatever maps you have of the river channels don't work very well. So they hit a, a sandbar, the boat was stuck, they had to get pulled off. The next day, the boat broke down. The third day, they hit two sandbars. And so it was taking forever to get up the river. And the team turned to him, to, to, to um, Mr. Wang Kuwen, who was the one I interviewed, about this, and they said, you know, it's going to take a hundred years to develop this for river travel. I, we wouldn't advise you to, to invest in this area. And it, they ended up with 200 hectares in a pilot project. And this is the last one. Um, I'm just going to tell you who this is. This is Kumbu Kalani Firi. He's a Zambian who was given a Chinese government scholarship to study in China. This is his Chinese wife. And in order to hear their story, you're going to have to read the book. Uh, but again, it's a story of how an African brought a Chinese company into his country, Zambia, and the story of why that didn't work. That was also the one that was supposed to be 2 million hectares. So what are the Chinese actually doing in Africa? Well, they've got a lot of agricultural aid projects. They have a lot of failed investments, but they have these agricultural aid projects. It's a very interesting model where Chinese companies are supported by the aid budget to build an agrotechnology demonstration center and then to use that as a platform for three years to go out and find investment opportunities. And so the Chinese government is using this public-private partnership model in order to, to provide aid because this is now owned by the host country and provide a way for Chinese companies to look for agricultural investments. And I'll show you some of uh, what they're actually doing. Now, this may seem like an alien model, but it's actually not that different from what we're doing. For example, um, the G8, and this is uh, something from USAID's website, we have this Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition in which we're bringing American companies and other multinationals in to work on food security issues. So it's a public-private partnership in which we're, we're helping to bring these companies in for uh, what we hope will be African food security, and no doubt it'll be good business for them as well. So Chinese companies are also interested, I keep like pointing this around, I'm not quite sure where, <laughs> where I should be pointing it. They're also interested in export markets. So this is from another one of the agrotechnology demonstration centers. This one happens to be in Zimbabwe. And the company that built this one wants to sell agricultural machinery because Zimbabwe has a well-developed agricultural sector. It's not labor intensive. It's very capital intensive. and They use machinery. So they think they can get a market there. Now, that's not that different from our company. So John Deere has also been uh, selling their equipment around. And I actually took this picture at another Chinese farm in Zambia, and he proudly showed me his John Deere tractors, and he said, you know, this stuff is so much better than what we can get in China. So uh, we're still doing well in terms of that competition. But the Chinese want to catch up. Then you've got uh, high technology. Some of you may have heard of uh, Yuan Longping. He's the father of hybrid rice, very famous scientist in China. He has a biotechnology company. He's trying to sell hybrid rice, and the company's marketing this around the world. So I went to meet him in Changsha, in a place I call the Rice Cluster. And there uh, he told me that, yes, they do have some small investments in Africa, but he wanted to talk to me about their work in Texas. <laughs> Because he said, you know, we have a huge relationship with rice growers in Texas. They're licensing our technology. And he said, the Americans pay us royalties. And he was very proud of this. He wasn't that interested in Africa. But, but this is another area in which there is some interest. Construction, these are state farms from Angola that Chinese companies are building for the Angolan government. Small-scale Chinese farms. Um, there's a, some Chinese who live in Zambia who are shopping. They're buying some spring onions from a Chinese farmer. He has about three or four hectares. And there are other farms in Zambia. But it's not as though the Chinese dominate agriculture there, not by a long shot. And the last thing that they're doing is uh, they're moving much more into contract farming. This is a real Chinese investment, 20,000 hectares. I don't know if you can see uh, this. It just, it's kind of strikingly big. It's in Mozambique. And when I went there, this thing just spreads out there. It's a delta. And you can imagine um, it's wonderful land, very black, rich soil. But the flood control is really bad, so they've had a lot of problems with that. But they're doing this as a subcontracting arrangement. So Mozambican farmers, um, like the woman I interviewed here, are going to be each given a chunk of that land. The Chinese are working with them to teach them how to grow rice and to do it in a mechanized way, and they're producing rice for the southern African market. So the last point is on the trade data. 
the trade data shows that right now China is feeding Africa. And so if you look at the trade data and you look at all the food that's going one way or going the other way, it's overwhelmingly coming from China into Africa. And most of that's actually packaged foods. So on, in the grocery stores, you can find things that are, are canned or boxed or otherwise frozen and made in China and sent to Africa. Because Africa is a food deficit region. They import 10 million tons of rice per year, for example. There is no way feasibly that this continent is going to be sending that rice, is growing rice and sending it back to China. It just doesn't make sense. So who's going to feed China? It's the Americas. The United States is going to send them corn. Brazil is going to continue to send them soybeans, and so is Argentina. So if they're going to be buying more food, they're going to be buying it from the Americas. And uh, I think that's going to be the case for the foreseeable future. Now, in 1966, there was a lot of fear about China in Africa at that point. A lot of books were being written. And there's one particularly good quote by the president of Congo Brazzaville. He said that Africa was under threat of a Chinese colonization that will be logical and effective and it will turn the entire continent into a Chinese rice field. That was 1966. That didn't happen. I don't think it's happening now. We read some things that uh, Africa is China's second continent, that they're uh, building a new empire. I don't think they actually are. I think what they're doing is globalization. They're following in our footsteps, as some of my colleagues have argued as well. They're playing our game. Uh, they're trying to become multinationals. They're going into agribusiness. They're trying to buy commodities. They're trying to uh, do subcontracting with farming, sell equipment, and so on. And I think the sooner we get a more realistic picture of what the Chinese are doing in the far reaches of the world, the better prepared we'll be to partner with the Chinese and perhaps to ensure that one day Africa is able to feed itself and then perhaps feed China. Thank you. That's, that's terrific. I mean, do we have any microphones? We're just using our voices here. Okay, we'll just use our voices. The why you, you in the book and what you just in the book and, and what you just described to us in, in your comments is terrible misinformation that led to wrong conclusions and probably policies which are imperfect as a result. Why? People are just too busy? Is there, I mean, the Chinese have a conspiratorial view of everything. Is there a, a conspiracy in the media to portray China as something that it's not? I don't think there's a conspiracy. What I do think, and I've noticed this for years, is that, um, and this is not new to you all either, China having a, f a headline or a front page of your magazine that has China on it is going to sell more copies. People are really interested in what China's doing. And the more, uh, the bigger it is, uh, the more uh, kind of exciting it is, the headline, uh, the more people are likely to pick it up and read it. So I do think that journalists have an incentive to, to not always dig deeply into uh, the reality. The other thing that I've noticed, and I've mentioned this before to you, Steve, is that I think that journalists these days, they just don't have the time or the expense account, perhaps, to do really in-depth investigative reporting. It's surprising how many people in very good uh, places, in, in the New York Times, at Reuters, at, at The Economist, the Financial Times, they recycled these things because they found them on the internet. And, they, and no one went to check these stories. There's not a single story, this big, what was supposed to be this uh, three million hectare project in, um, in the DRC that I looked at, I don't think another journalist has written this up. It just was a headline and then it got into the conventional wisdom and no one ever went to check to see did it happen. And the same thing with Zambia, no one ever wrote that up. Two million hectares that China has, uh, has asked or China has requested and it turns out it was a Zambian <laughs> who actually requested two million hectares for biofuel in Zambia. So, and the project didn't work out. So there are lots of ways in which these projects didn't work. Um, but there was very little follow-up on these headlines. You, you attended the meeting that Xi Jinping had, I think, in Africa. The FOCOC. At the end of last year. Sort of. 
how? I couldn't get into all the official uh, That's right. parts. I, I mean, I don't expect that you had a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, she and me. How, how was he welcomed, and what is kind of the African perception of Chinese policy today? People ask me this a lot. What does Africa really think <laughs> about China? And the way I usually answer that is that I say, I refer to public opinion polls. I'm a political scientist, so we tend to rely on, on science and evidence. And the evidence suggests that uh, across the continent, on average, China is popular. So there's a positive opinion about China. There's also a positive opinion about the United States. So it's a uh, a little bit higher than China on average. And whether you look at the BBC polls, the Pew polls, Afrobarometer, they all suggest this. <coughs> That's across the continent. There are unevennesses there. Uh, for example, I think the worst uh, public opinion about China is in South Africa. So they have the lowest opinion, and it tends to get closer to European opinion, which is interesting. Um, other parts of Africa, there are some places, like Nigeria, they like China more, they like us less. Kenya, they like America more, not surprisingly, and uh, China less. So there are those variations. But by and large, it's, it's um, positive. So that's, that's what Africans think in general. Now, Xi Jinping was in South Africa for something called the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, the FOCAC. This happens, it's, it's an ongoing forum, but they have a summit or, or a, a ministerial every three years. So this was in South Africa. The one before was in Beijing, and they swap back and forth every three years. So what China does and what, the, what Beijing does, the government, they present um, pledges at these FOCOC. So they're very popular. They will say, we're going to put this much finance in. We're going to uh, do this much. We're going to try to have these funds we're going to set up. We're going to um, ramp up our security cooperation. That was one of the 10 pledges this time around. We're going to uh, lower trade barriers. They do a lot of different things that can shape their uh, economic and political engagement over the next three years. And these, these are not just invented by the Chinese. They actually work on these in Beijing with the African embassies there. So they have working groups uh, to develop the FOCAC. But these are um, pretty popular. And at this one, Xi Jinping's big package was that they were going to put an additional $60 billion of finance of various kinds um, into Africa over three years and beyond. So that's huge. And I was really surprised because at the last FOCAC, it, would, it had been about $20 billion that they said they would put in. And then this one, I thought, well, it's it's going to go up, but China's growth is slowing. It's not going to go up that much. And then to go from 20 to 60 was, was a big leap, a great leap. Are U.S. interests and Chinese interests in Africa basically complementary or conflicting? And are there areas where the U.S. and China can cooperate more deeply in Africa? I think they're hugely complementary. If you see, even in things like technology, we have, um, we have the consulting firms that can be the uh, engineering firms that can ensure good design and, and good um, uh, implementation of infrastructure contracts. And the Chinese have the companies that can carry that out. So that's, we have the credible companies like Bechtel and others that can, can uh, provide that oversight. So j even in the construction area where they're a lot cheaper than we are, I think there are complementarities there. One of the areas where we have been cooperating quite well with the Chinese in Africa is in the security realm. And this is surprising. I think it's, it may be the most successful uh, cooperation that we have. And so if you look at the piracy challenges along the Gulf of Aden outside of Somalia, uh, the Chinese are now building their first overseas uh, supply center or base in Djibouti. We already have a base there. But the Chinese, the Americans, the French, the Japanese, uh, other international players have been doing these, these convoys and helping ships go through that pirate-infested area. Um, and they've been coordinating all of that together. So we've been operating qu quite well in that realm. The Chinese have also been um, much more constructive over the past seven years or so on the Sudan issue. So they've been working with our diplomats to try to uh, help negotiate peace between South Sudan and, and Khartoum. So they've been active in that area, too, after a, a very slow start, um, which was uh, had to do with the Darfur issue, which they didn't play a constructive role there until about two, 2007. Um, so three or four years of being obstructionist. But they've been coming around on that. So um, I do think there are areas in which we do coordinate better. Um, in other areas, we are kind of competitive. 
So we're both looking to win friends and influence people in Africa. Um, the aid program, I think, is, is complementary because the Chinese build things. Um, I testified on the Hill for something that Senator Coons had organized about China and Africa, and he had a big sign there, and he said, the U.S. is putting 70 percent of our aid into health, which we are, AIDS. HIV, malaria, tuberculosis. The Chinese are putting 70 percent of their aid into infrastructure, which they are. So those are very complementary kinds of activities. You can improve health, but unless you have a road to get your pregnant wife to the hospital, uh, it doesn't help that much. So these kinds of things, telecommunication networks, the Chinese are very big in that area as well. So I do think there's, there's a lot of complementarity. Um, however, there's still rivalry. So we do have um, areas of rivalry that are are intense. Um, our companies compete with each other, although, again, not as much as you would think, um, partly because our companies are already there and we have the best assets. <laughs> so the Chinese are coming along for the lesser assets, the more troublesome ones. So we have an audience that is knowledgeable both on China and on Africa. So if people want to put up their hands and um, ask some questions, that certainly is uh, fine. Thank you so much. Uh, I am not an expert in Africa. I'm learning a lot sitting here. Oh, sorry. Bob Peterson. Um, you, you've been talking mostly about investment in Africa. Uh, to what extent has China been involved either in military aid, arms sales, you know, government to government type aid? The Chinese are now, I believe, the third largest um, arms seller in the world. I think we're still first. And I think Russia might be second, I'm not sure, but I think they're third now. And Africa is no exception to that. And they're probably, in terms of large-scale arms um, sales in Africa, we're still more prominent because we have the really large-scale military hardware and, and the Chinese are not as, as competitive in that area. But in terms of small arms, they're selling all across the continent. And this is a, a function, it goes very much along with China's trade model. So the companies that do... Uh, these arms sales, most of these are not financed through their aid program, their military aid program. There might be some loss leaders. They have some uh, jets that they've sold to Zimbabwe. There's some other um, military or, or dual-use hardware that they've sold in some places, some planes. But, uh, but these are mainly market transactions. So they're selling to African governments. They're probably selling to combatants, too. But these are I examples of companies that were, they're not quite privatized, but they were companies that were owned by the Ministry of Defense, like Norinco. Some of you may be familiar with Norinco, North Industries. These are large-scale arms manufacturers in China who are now being told, as all of those companies have been, go out and find markets. So it's, it's like with uh, telecoms like Huawei or, or other uh, construction companies. They're all being told, go global, go out and find markets. So they are finding arms markets for their products. It's, in some ways, it's just a trade thing like any other thing, except it happens to be in, in weapons, um, which is something of concern, certainly. So you do have examples of, uh, during the uh, Eritrea and Ethiopian conflicts, both, they're selling to both sides, so this, somehow they get away with that. <laughs> On the other hand, they're playing um, a very constructive role in terms of UN peacekeeping forces. So up until 2000, the Chinese were very uncomfortable with the whole idea of peacekeeping. They um, regularly abstained. They, they didn't support the UN peacekeeping roles because it looked too much to them like interfering in other countries' internal affairs, which is one of the proscribed things for Chinese foreign policy. But this peacekeeping role in 2000 has just taken off. And so you have Chinese blue helmets um, around the world. They were uh, sent to Haiti, and the Chinese don't even have diplomatic ties to Haiti, but their Chinese blue helmets were there. Uh, as peacekeepers. They are in a lot of parts of Africa because a lot of the conflicts are there. They've been in Eastern Europe. They've also been in, in uh, Asia, some of the conflicts there. But um, so they have, the. I think that out of the G5, the Security Council 5, they are the largest supplier, of, certainly by far, of personnel into this. This has very recently changed in an important way, and that is in the past, the Chinese peacekeepers were always engineers, or other support personnel, they weren't armed. So for the very first time in Mali, 
when peacekeepers came in there, the Chinese sent a small armed contingent, and the purpose of that contingent was to protect the UN compound. So they were armed. That was the very first time. Now we have a bigger contingent of Chinese armed peacekeepers, and they are in, Su in South Sudan. So they're also uh, there to keep uh, a very uncertain peace. Now, I was uh, talking to uh, people. I was at the Carter Center in January and had uh, the negotiators from the U.S. side and from the Chinese side on the, the Sudan issue, and the Carter Center was trying to bring them together with some uh, outside expertise to strategize ways forward for cooperation between the U.S. and China. And so we had these, uh, these shuttle diplomats and these uh, special representatives, both from China and the U.S., and so I asked uh, the U.S. side, I said, what are those uh, armed peacekeepers actually doing in South Sudan? Because I hear from some reports that they're there to protect the Chinese oil fields. <laughs> and he said, yes, I've read that too, but that's actually not the case. This is the American telling me this. So he said there's some other peacekeepers that are off there. They are protecting the oil fields, but it's not the Chinese. So the Chinese are in another part of, of South Sudan protecting something else. So it's true that the oil fields have some UN peacekeeper protection. And he said that's because the oil is the only revenue source for South Sudan. So they need to protect that from attacks by the opposition. Otherwise, they're going to be totally <laughs> tanked because they'll have no revenues whatsoever. But um, I'm sure the Chinese like having that there, but it wasn't Chinese armed peacekeepers doing that. You're welcome. Good. About uh, storage, I'm Jack Morris from the Star Companies. Uh, two about uh, storage facilities built to house grain, store grain, built to feed Africa. And the other is also about crop insurance. Okay. So the first question is about storage facilities built by the Chinese? No, just in general. In general. Well, uh, I don't remember the exact statistics, but in the book I have a chapter on, on challenges and problems uh, with African agriculture. And in there, there is a statistic about uh, crop losses due to poor storage, and it's very high. It's two, maybe three times higher than in a developed country context. So you've, it's very rare that you will find these big silos, metal silos for crop storage. One place where you do find them is in Zimbabwe. But they're empty <laughs> these days because of all of the, uh, the fast-track land reform there, which has basically emptied out the silos. And the irrigation systems are pretty much um, were dis destroyed or they don't have electricity and their problems. So in Zimbabwe, South Africa, places like that, you do see these big silos. Um, and there are other areas uh, in which there is there's storage, but not necessarily for food crops. One of the... Um, let me segue over into one of the areas where the Chinese are consuming and demanding food from Africa. So there is some trade data of food products going from Africa to China, and two in particular. There are five agricultural products that are the top five, and these are data from 2014. The number one agricultural product going from Africa to China is a food product. And you're probably thinking, oh, is it maybe rice? Or <laughs> because it's very hard for people to let go of that idea that rice and maize and wheat and so on are, are running from Africa to China. They're not. It's sesame seeds. So by value, that's the number one agricultural commodity in 2014 going into China. And this is because uh, the, this whole swath of the Sahel and Ethiopia, Ethiopia produces very high quality sesame seeds. And if you've ever been to China, you will see sesame used all over the place. It's in desserts, it's in sesame oil that you use with your jiaozi and your, your uh, guatia, your, your dumplings and so on. And it's, um, it's used with breakfast things. Your shabing yotiao is going to have your sesame seeds on it. So it's, uh, it's used a lot. Even in Japan, I was just there a few days ago, and I noticed there's a lot of sesame in Japan, too. So sesame. The number five uh, agricultural commodity going into to China from Africa is cocoa. So there are two things there that, that the Chinese are consuming that are food products made in Africa. The other three are co uh, cotton, tobacco, and rubber. So the other question, that one was on the storage and one was on the crop insurance. crop insurance. There have been experiments with crop insurance. Um, I don't think any of them have been widespread, and I don't think any of them have been at a national level. And I could be wrong about that with regard to South Africa. They're always much more um, sophisticated than other parts of the continent. So they, if anyone would have tried that, it would probably be South Africa, but I don't know. That's, that's getting beyond my area of expertise. Certainly the Chinese have not been involved in that. I could say that definitively. You 
you okay, um, the highest hand there, which is you on the aisle. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Thank you very much for this. Uh, my name is Cochin. I'm a master candidate at Columbia University. I'm not an expert on applicants. I'm both students here and back in my school. Uh, I've been troubled by a conspiracy theory these days. That's why I'm desperate to be here to listen to you, actually, let alone my midterm exams tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, thank you. That's quite a. That's quite flattering. <laughs> the, the series like this is. Uh, it says the uh, the uh, why Africa is this poor is because first the U.S. is dumping food in this continent, while China is dumping its manufacturing goods there. Because all the U.S. is helping with education and uh, humanitarian aid, while China is building infrastructures, they're not helping with uh, with the, the the farming and actually the manufacturing in this continent. So. I had a hard time from trying to, it's not that compelling, but I need to find some evidence to debate against <laughs> Oh, is this a take-home midterm? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm also a professor of development studies, so this gets into some of the things that we talk about a lot in our classes about development strategies and why are some countries poor and, and some countries are becoming more prosperous. And I think the, the ultimate answer is not to do with what's happening from the outside. Um, I'm involved in a research project with uh, a number of other scholars in which we look at China's engagement with different world regions, and maybe some of them will be coming to speak to you here at the council. But um, the, if you look at China's engagement in Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia has not become deindustrialized as a result of trading with China. They haven't, uh, you know, they don't have problems with supplying food to their people in, in Southeast Asia. So th this is a much more successful development strategies that have been adopted by countries there. And in part, I've argued that it's in part they have a good relationship, an economic relationship with Japan, and Japan has been really a stimulator in that area. But it's mainly that uh, governments and many of the governments there have put in place good conditions for investment to happen. And not just foreign investment, but domestic investment. So this has been something that was uh, synergistic there. In most parts of Africa, you just don't see those good conditions. The places where I'm doing research right now, one of the best uh, for this is, is actually Ethiopia. They're putting in place a lot of policies. They want to get manufacturing going. It's becoming a better and better environment for that. But there are still a lot of problems. Uh, for example, they have a lot of foreign exchange controls. It makes it hard to get your money in and out. Uh, people get a little concerned about that. Um, and there are other problems. They're trying to do things with infrastructure, but it's still quite weak. So. The, the answer for these kinds of things, and I'd say the same is true for Latin America or the United States, it really comes down to our own government. And it's not a question of governance with regard to corruption. I think corruption is actually overrated as, as the primary obstacle to development. I think what's much more important is the government having a strategic plan, not necessarily a five-year plan, but a, str a strategy for development, and then putting uh, instruments together to make that happen and really having that passion. One of the countries I've done a lot of research on is Mauritius, a tiny little island in the Indian Ocean. But it's a real success story. And it's in part, uh, there are a lot of reasons why they became successful, but the bottom line is that the governments put in place conditions where investment could happen, domestic investment and foreign investment. And this worked synergistically, created a lot of employment, moved them up the value chain. So that's what they've got to do. And there are very few places in Africa right now where you can say the governments are really developmental. In the far back, and then you're next. Uh, hello, Professor. My name is Chris Kwok. Um, I'm not an expert in Africa and China either, but that's why I'm here to ask you this question. My view is a large conceptual question about how um, the West or America or Europe viewed Africa. Uh, before Chinese investment in manufacturing and as Africa as a market to sell goods. I just didn't, sort of growing up here in America, see the West think of Africa as a place for investment in infrastructure or for markets. And then when China entered uh, into Africa with money and backing, it totally changed the view. And that's sort of, I think, and I think the West saw that because of deeply racist sort of views of Africa. And I'm wondering if the numbers back that up, you know, that, that the West and Europe and America didn't start investing in Africa until China did, because then it said, wow. Hmm. Uh, let me say a few things about that. Uh, first of all, in terms of, of racist views, the, I think if anything, uh, the racism on the part of the Chinese side is pretty high. 
So there's, there are racist views on both sides, certainly, uh, but, but uh, Chinese are not immune to that at all. No, of course they didn't colonize Africa, and they're very proud about that. It's, it's a part of their brand in Africa. They were not the colonial power, and they still aren't. <laughs> but um, but that is a historical truth. Um, I'm teasing you a little bit, but just I do want to point out there are definitely problems um, with, with the, the cultural conflicts between Africans and Chinese, just as there have been with Europeans. But in terms of uh, what you're talking about, the... Um, so, in uh, what were you talking about? Oh, investment. So, investment trends. So, yeah, I remember the uh, investment. The debt. The data doesn't actually bear that out because there has been a lot of American investment going into Africa all along. Uh, we've been, we're big investors in Angola, for example, in the oil sector. We're big investors in Equatorial Guinea when they found oil. We became big investors there. So, we are uh, pretty big investors. What's also interesting is that Canada, in terms of minerals, they, they are probably even a bigger investor than we are. Canada may be the number one investor in minerals in, in Africa, so not China. So that's uh, also something that's of interest to people. But um, all the data suggests that the U.S. has continued to be a big investor, but only in very narrow areas. So it's pretty much oil. Um, and then in a few places like South Africa, we invest in South Africa, somewhat in Nigeria. Uh, but in a lot of other places, we're just not present in very big numbers. And so I think that is what has caused more attention. Now, I would agree with you completely that there has been this general framing of Africa as a place that needs our help. And so we see Africa as a kind of place of, of, that needs pity and it's kind of chaotic, child soldiers, drought, starvation. This is a general framing of what Africa looks like for Americans. And that is not the case for the Chinese. It looks like a place to do business. They don't see on their televisions over and over, you know, dial 1-800 and give to the starving child. That's not how it's framed. So there's a very different picture there. And that does suggest that it's a place that's open for business. But there's also a reality to that. If you look at a lot of the areas where the Chinese can do business there, the things that they can export to Africa, the things that Africans can afford to buy, it's much more Chinese goods than it is American goods, by and large. That Chinese um, farmer that I photographed with the John Deere tractor, he's an exception. He can afford to go for the really good stuff. Um, that farm has been there since 1990. So they made enough profit that they can invest in good machinery. But um, a, a lot of parts of Africa, they just can't afford what we produce. Uh, but they can't afford what the Chinese produce. And I hear over and over again from manufacturers on a research project, which may, may be my next book, uh, they say the equipment is better in Europe. We would much rather buy things from Germany, like manufacturing machinery. But the Chinese machinery is so much cheaper. And of course it breaks down, it doesn't last as long, but we can replace it. And uh, we can just, we can afford to get into this market without having to um, wait. Um, I said that you would get the next one and there you. Uh, I was Brian Goldberg, also went to Columbia at one point and did a lot of Chinese studies there. but. Uh, it's interesting that um, I had started this little chain of Chinese restaurants in, in Hong Kong, actually Beijing style street food in Hong Kong a couple years ago. Um, and the place that we got the most franchise requests out of nowhere was Africa. And it was shocking that that was happening. I mean, that there was some CNN coverage of it that I think was broadcast there. And it was amazing to see these people, the entrepreneurs, emailing and calling from Angola and from. from in Zimbabwe and from Congo asking to open up Mr. Bing. Look, we do Gem Bing, you know, Beijing Street Link Gem Bing things, right? Cool. Like little, small little kiosks. And cool. they were asking for it. I was just shocked, like, what's going on? And I, I mean, I, I read the headlines, obviously, about Chinese investment in Africa. But uh, I guess there was, uh, there were, it was clearly showing us that a lot of Chinese people living there, working there, and looking for their, their oh, own man. food. I don't know how big the investment projects actually are, but, you know, there's a lot of people there, a lot of China, and, the, and African people that were entrepreneurially looking to feed Chinese people in Africa. Yeah. And I was like, I was, That's great. I, just, I found it very interesting. Um, so, I mean, 
slightly off topic, but I guess kind of related. That's a really interesting example of there is this huge amount of entrepreneurial spirit uh, amongst the Chinese in Africa. And there's so many people that I've talked to, so many interesting stories. A, a woman, for example, I, I talked to in Sierra Leone, she and her husband have this thing called Chinatown. I don't know if any of you have been to Lumley Beach in Freetown, but they have it's along the beach there. And they, she's got two Chinese restaurants, one a more formal one, one a more casual one. She's got a barbecue, which attracts more of the African clientele. She's got a hairdressing salon, a wine bar, a cake store, a gift shop, and, and then a bed and breakfast behind. So all of these, and I asked her, how did you do all this? And she said, well, I used to be a teacher in Guangdong. Then I saw this ad in the newspaper for an English-speaking person to come and work with a Chinese a Hong Kong company that was investing in Sierra Leone. So she went there. The war happened. Uh, the company left. She stayed in Freetown. She decided to rent a shop front, and she, she went with her savings back to China, filled a container full of goods, brought them back to Freetown in that storefront, sold everything, brought a few more containers in. Married a Lebanese guy, you know, using his business networks, and they're just she just amazing. So these were, these were Africans asking to open up with yeah. Chinese Mr. Bing restaurants, not, yeah. not actual Chinese. They well, that's the people working there, I guess, or the towns that are sprouting up. Or, Did you do any of these? Not yet. Not yet. Not exactly. Let me know if you do. <laughs> I want to find Mr. Bing on my next trip to Africa. <laughs> yes. And so first of all, I just I want to thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for giving us the facts. And, you know, it's, it's not just circumstances, it's really facts and figures. Um, because not being an African uh, expert, I did go to uh, uh, Marrakesh for the first Sino um, Africa Entrepreneurs Conference in November. Wow. 26 or 27. All the ministers from almost like 20 countries are there, and a lot of entrepreneurs and major corporations like Beijing Capitals. So everything you said were true. Everybody really, there's enormous amount of opportunities. So let's not even go there. The two questions. One is, there must be problems that you see that we don't know. So what keeps you up at night if we do send people like us wanting to look for opportunities? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the railroad companies there. The second question is regarding the Sino-African Development Fund. Nobody tells me anything. I keep asking questions. So do you know anything about what's happening and what are they doing? It is one belt, one road initiatives. That's how the whole almost 300 people gather in Marrakesh. I mean, it's beautiful, it's fantastic, but mm. but there must be things that it's like, oh, I went to Iran twice recently. It's awful, but it's fantastic. Great opportunity. Yeah. So, how interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we don't know. We have to go and learn. There are still a lot of challenges, and I think the book points out a lot of them. One of the biggest was infrastructure still. So Chinese companies are actually building a huge amount of infrastructure in Africa. Most of it is not being financed by any of these Chinese funds. About According to our calculations, about 20% of the work that Chinese companies are doing in infrastructure is being financed by China or Chinese banks. But the rest is being financed by African governments, many of which have oil or other resources, or the World Bank or the African Development Bank or private investors of various kinds that are hiring Chinese to do things. So, But infrastructure is still a big gap, and uh, this can only fill a, a small portion. Most countries in Africa, and this includes South Africa even now, are suffering from electricity shortages. So South Africa hasn't invested adequately in, uh, in its own electricity production. And then there are a lot of controversies about going into coal. So um, that, that's probably the new investments that are going into power are coal power plants, which is going to be hard for the planet. So that thing about infrastructure, if I was an investor, I would really look very carefully at where, where the roads are. You know the Chinese saying, if you want to become prosperous, first build a road. So that's a really very true in Africa. Um, in terms of funds, the Chinese government has a lot of special funds for Africa, and these are investment funds. They have one that was set up in 2007, which is called the China-Africa Development Fund, that's supposed to go up to $5 billion eventually. It's, um, in the recent FOCOC in Johannesburg, they added another $5 billion, so now it will go up to $10 billion eventually. But right now it's only at about $3 billion. So, and that's been since 20, 000, 2007, so that's over nine years to get to $3 billion. So it's going to take a long time. It just shows that they don't have as many investment opportunities. There's, um, 
there's debate over whether the investment opportunities are just there and they just need the capital or whether the capital is there and the, the investment opportunities aren't. So I would say that there's there certainly are opportunities, but it really depends where and it depends what sector. My question is not opportunity. That's a foregone conclusion. My question was what were the problems that may keep you up at night? Infrastructure. It keeps me up at night because not all the hotels where I stay have have um, generators. So, <laughs> yeah, I can remember one in particular. I had to open the windows, and boy, I stayed up. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to say that we've reached the bewitching hour. Um, you know, there are, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but this is um, this has been a fantastic opening to our 50th anniversary celebration which is called China and the World, and starting with Africa and this book. I often flawed, and you need to dig deeply to find out what's really going on. And what Deborah and I talked about before the meeting was what does this mean kind of for the China studies generally? Are people doing enough deep dives to be able to counter the narrative in the media? But this book does a fabulous job. It's a it's a wonderful read. Thank you for being a director. Thank you so much for writing the book, and thank you for being here.